Wow, what a ride we have had this last week. From a toy example of backpropagation all the way to transformers, we have seen how deep learning can be a very useful tool for natural language processing. And these truly are marvelous algorithms that are very powerful. However, there are still many challenges that we have left unsolved in how they can help us process language. These are some of the ones that we're going to look at in this presentation. Um, neural networks are, have been called black boxes because it's very difficult to understand what they're doing in order to go from input to output. Because they're so opaque, it's very difficult to detect biases that might be in them. And so our uh, algorithms might continue to be biased. These models need a lot of data, like gigabytes of data. And because of this, they cannot be used for many languages, indigenous languages, smaller languages. They use a lot of data and they're still very brittle models and they can be fooled by slight variations in the input. And even if we throw all through all the gigabytes of data in the world at them, there's still a lot of knowledge that will forever escape a deep learning solution things that we refer to as common sense and that might not be found written amongst the text. As we didn't have enough challenges, all of these models have huge environmental costs that we need to consider. And they're so big and expensive to train and to uh, generate that only fewer and fewer actors are going or do now have the capacity to train these elements fully. And these might affect who controls these algorithms in the future. So let's go through these one at a time. Black boxes. Indeed, um, we have inputs and outputs. Let's take the simplest network, a uh, feed forward neural network. We have input, hidden layers, and an output. What are the weights doing? These weights in the middle and the layers in the middle have some arithmetic operation that is, you know, doing some math magic until we torturously get the output that we need. But what is the relationship between the weight, for example, and the input? Is it learning a feature of the input? Is, if so, what feature? The connection between the weights, the hidden layers and the weights, all the internal parts of the neural network, between those and the inputs and outputs, it's opaque at best. And it is always often impossible to understand exactly what a neural network is doing. This might make it so that um, these seem like magic, they're just doing their thing, but we really don't understand what rules they're following other than doing arith crazy arithmetic. This is a very nice article about a group of researchers that are trying to peer into the black box. There's a kind of a uh, visual neural network called the convolutional network, a ConfNet, that uh, you might choose to, um, to study in your exercise. They process images, and it's one, because they're images, it's easier to look at what the hidden layers are doing in these kinds of visual networks. So for example, we have the picture on the left, which is correctly identified as a gray whale by one of these ConfNets, and the picture on the right which has a, uh, the same picture, but now with a baseball, is identified as a great white shark. But why? It's probably because of the way hidden layers mix the inputs. They remix inputs in thousands of different ways. And some of them, as you can see on the right, make the seams of the baseball kind of look like the teeth of a shark, maybe. Uh, as you can see, the, the, um, the inputs that make it um, the weight as they're calculated, make some of these hidden images look a little bit like a great white shark. And that's why the network is doing this. And research is still ongoing on to try to figure out exactly what it is that these networks are doing to the input to then transform it into the output. Because it's so difficult to understand what they're doing, they're even more susceptible to biases. I mean, First of all, we're using word embeddings as the input. For example, all of our transformers were using word embeddings like word to vec or glove, which is uh, glove. I'm sorry, which is a different uh, kind of embedding, but similar to word to vec. 
And we already know that these are biased to start with. So we're starting with bias and then we're adding all this arithmetic that we don't really understand. And so this is going to make biases even more difficult to detect. This is an article from Reuters about how Amazon in 2018 had this artificial intelligence recruiting tool, but they found out it was biased um, against women because it was learning uh, what the successful features were in order for you to become an employee of Amazon. And one of them was being a man, just because in the training set, it had so many more men that were previously employed in the tech industry. And so it interpreted that as a factor of success. <clears throat> Again, it's incredibly difficult to understand exactly what neural networks are doing with our input to turning it into turn it into an output. And this makes them even more fragile when it comes to hidden biases. Let's talk about data for a minute. As we saw, the GPT-2 needed 40 gigabytes of text to train. Uh, the BERTs have a multilingual version that takes text from, I think, 110 Wikipedias. So all of the English Wikipedia, all of the Spanish language Wikipedia, all of the French language Wikipedia, and so forth. Um, even small data sets like the Stanford Squad, which has questions and answers, is about 100,000 pairs. It's impossible for us to generate these kinds of data sets for indigenous languages, for smaller languages. And so we cannot use deep learning solutions with these kinds of languages. There are processes called transfer learning, where people try to transfer um, what they learned for English into other languages, for example, but these are limited in its reach. And you can, you can train a bird from the start with data from Riri because there's just not enough data. Even with all of the data, even with all the Wikipedia or 40 gigs, our uh, neural networks are still very brittle. They're still fragile and can be fooled by the slightest bit of change in the input or the slightest bit of um, disruption in the input. Uh, the paper is li uh, linked on the lower left. As you can see, these are pictures of a woman riding a horse on a dirt road or a group of people standing on top of a beach. Very chill. So if the input changes ever so slightly, the neural network might be confused just because it's so accustomed to the input. The input determines it that much. This, if you go to Google Translate right now, pause the video, go to Google Translate, and try to translate ad hominem from Latin and English, because I just checked, it's still translated as gooseberry. So even with all of the data from Latin, it will still make these kinds of mistakes. Go ahead and pause it. <laughs> so even with 40 gigs of data, even with all the Wikipedias, even if we manage to uh, make the networks more resilient, there's still so much in the world that is never written down in input text. And so the computer could never be able to access this knowledge. A, a name that we have for this is common sense. But also in general, a lot of um, procedures of what it means to be embodied in the world, or what it means to understand entities in the world and understand the physics of the world. Just uh, for the example on the left, are there more trees than animals in that picture? Um, you could throw as much data as you want into a uh, sequence to sequence model. It's not going to be able to do it. Um, by the way, there's a lecture linked on the lower left about uh, someone from the MIT IBM Watson lab presenting on exactly these kinds of issues. So they need a lot of data, which we don't have from any languages, which is not going to be enough to make them resilient, and which does not include a lot of common sense about the world in the first place. So even if we take this much, uh, make this much sacrifice to generate all this data, it might still not be enough. So they're very data hungry, which means that they need a lot of processing and storage and computing, which means that they're going to emit massive amounts of CO2. Uh, unfortunately, training these models, as you can see, takes energy. It takes 
uh, electricity, to run the storage, to run the networks. And it, it can amount to as much uh, CO2 generated as a car or, a t or 60 people approximately to train a big transformer. So they are very costly environmentally and in terms of energy. They are very costly in terms of storage. For example, uh, loading some of these large birds into memory takes gigs of data. And at some point, the party's going to stop. Those models are going to become so large that we will no longer have the processing power to train them or to use them. And this brings us to one final problem, which is that because they are so large, only, uh, only very few companies can train them and make them. As you can see here, Facebook has Roberta, for example, which is kind of BERT. Uh, Hugging Face has the Stillbert, which is a smaller version of BERT. Uh, Microsoft had the 17 billion uh, parameter model. There's one from Google. There's only one that's academic from University of Washington. And so what it means is that if you, as a programmer, want to, if you want to make one of these, you're going to have to be working with for someone that has a computer big enough to make them. And there's going to be very few of those companies. And this will um, yeah, affect who controls these models and what they're going to be used for. There is some research, thankfully, for, for this particular problem. For example, trying to simplify networks. For example, you can prune weights and even prune layers to try to make uh, a large network more lightweight. You could use something called distillation, which is getting, for example, a big bird and then trying to teach a smaller bird how to get the same results. So there is some research on how to make these more environmentally friendly and easier to run. Um, this is what's happening right now in the field of deep learning and natural language processing. So there's still a lot of work that we have to do to uncover the biases that might be creeping into our neural networks, to diminish the environmental footprint of deep learning, to make it so that these models continue to be open and we can all benefit from them. And these are some challenges that we have in order to improve our natural language processing. As a big summary, um, we've been talking about neural networks and deep learning. They provide us with very powerful algorithms that can transform sequences into other sequences and allow us to pay specific attention to certain parts of sequences. Because of these because of this combination, transformation of sequences and att focused attention, we have found a potential solution to that uh, problem that have been, has been chasing us for weeks, the long distance dependency problem. And we finally have something that might help us to really model human language. However, there's still many issues that we need to solve. And that's where we need you to help us continue with the research. Next week, we're going to switch gears and look at a different aspect of natural language, parsing, parsing sentences so that uh, uh, your phone can understand that you wanted to play a song.